I'm Indy Nidell, and this is Out of the Trenches, where I sit here in my chair of wisdom and answer all your questions about the First World War. Deus Gladiorum writes, Potential question for Out of the Trenches. I don't know. Actual question for Out of the Trenches now. Okay, given their infamous treatment of POWs in World War II, I wonder if Indy could talk about how the Japanese treated the German POWs captured at Qingdao. Um, after the fall of Qingdao, around 4,600, 4,700 Germans and a few Austro-Hungarian prisoners were sent to multiple, more or less improvised, prison camps on Japan. The Japanese military had a strong desire to be taken seriously and be treated as an equal by its European allies. So they stuck to the Hague Convention. This led to the treatment of prisoners more like guests and less as combatants of an enemy nation. There were, of course, a few incidents like the unwillingness of German officers to celebrate the birthday of the Japanese emperor, which did lead to physical punishment. But for the most part, the Germans enjoyed a friendly and relaxed atmosphere compared to prison camps anywhere in Europe. Uh, many Japanese officers had studied in the military academies in Germany, spoke German. Others felt strongly connected to the old traditions of the samurai clans and followed their codex that a defeated enemy should be met with respect. The freedoms the prisoners enjoyed, well, differed from camp to camp though, of course. Um, some were allowed to work in the factories and were paid a, a decent salary. Some were allowed to go on hikes or swim in the sea, play concerts, take part in sports events, classes, things like that. Fun fact, okay, in the prison camp of Naruto in Tokushima, the prisoners organized a band that played Beethoven's Ninth Symphony in town. This became so popular that Beethoven's Ode to Joy is nowadays still a very popular New Year's tradition in Japan with the chorus often being sung in German. Uh, Mike83 New York writes, Indy, you and the crew are doing a fantastic job. You guys are doing a fantastic job. And me too. Okay, he's got a question for Out of the Trenches. I was visiting Wolfstein a few years ago and came across a World War I memorial. Knowing that World War II Nazi rem rem remembrances excuse me, are prohibited in Germany, how are World War I memorials, graves, and other relics of that time treated? Well, first of all, you really have to differentiate between the remembrance of the Nazi era and the remembrance of the Second World War. This one is, of course, strictly forbidden in German, and this one, like the remembrance of its victim, it's still carried on. Um, for the Great War, there are still memorials, statues, street names and monuments that were built to remember the soldiers in the war. Uh, especially in smaller towns, universities, or cemeteries, you can often find remembrance stones with the names of the soldiers engraved on them that died in the Great War. You can still visit the original grave of the Red Baron here in Berlin if you like. Um, many organizations often from the church or transnational associations put wreaths on the graves in the cemeteries in November or light candles on the tomb of the unknown soldier. But this is often done in silence without attention from the press or politicians. One issue with the memorials of the Great War is the date when they were built, right? There's often a big difference in the gestures and expressions of the statues that were built in, say, 1919 as opposed to 1930. And that's one reason why nowadays there's still a big push in Germany to change street names like that of von Hindenburg or Galwitz, or, or to change the name of squares or, or even remove the statues entirely. Okay, this one is anonymous. You should really put your name when you write a question because then I'll say it out. Ooh, maybe he's on the lamb. Maybe, maybe he did something, he was fighting the man, and the man's chasing him, and he's on the lamb. All right, well, I'm gonna answer his question. Hi, Indian team. I realize that this was a while back now, but I remember you were talking about the food shortage crisis, shortage crisis excuse me, in Germany and Austria-Hungary in 1916. What was the situation like for the Ottoman Empire? On one hand, it has a large area of fertile soil. On the other, it also has a large desert. Could the Ottoman Empire sustain itself? What about its allies, like Germany and Austria-Hungary? Could it support them, and was there any food trade? Well, <clears throat> the food situation in the Ottoman Empire was dire as well. That's just 
putting it mildly. Um, the regions on the periphery of the empire suffered the most from the shortages and the requisitions during wartime. Most notably, perhaps, is what is known as the Great Famine of Mount Lebanon. The Entente blocked the trade routes in the same way that they blocked Germany or Austria-Hungary. And the mountainous region that is nowadays much of Lebanon was already dependent on foreign trade for food supplies and basic goods in exchange for silk and other tradable goods. But now, the war not only cut them off from the rest of the world, the Ottoman army began the requisitioning of grain for its own needs. The resulting famine killed more than 200,000 from a population of not even half a million in that region. Uh, another big famine developed in Syria as a plague of locusts, really just like biblical, a plague of locusts ravaged whole areas in 1915. And in Palestine, where the war was a tremendous strain on the local resources. Palestine as well relied on foreign food imports. And many people starved to death there during the war. This situation inside the Ottoman Empire is actually also a field of study that has only recently gained widespread interest. Uh, Andre Radu writes, Could you guys cover the tactics of the Battle of Marasheshti? You said you'll cover it <laughs> in and out of the trenches. Well, you're right, we did say that back, way back in the way. I thought we covered it pretty well eventually in the regular episodes, but what the heck. Well, we promised we would look into it so here we go. <clears throat> the prelude to the Battle of Marasheshti was the Battle of Marashti, which had forced the German high command to change its original plans from an attack over the Siret to an attack against the Russian forces around Bilyeshti, from which they didn't expect much resistance anymore, and punch into the left flank of the Romanians under Alexandru Avarescu. The attack began on the 6th of August with heavy German artillery fire on the Russian positions, causing disarray and the Russians to break and to flee. But already, Romanian counterfire began slowing down the expected easy pursuit. Despite the flight of the Russian soldiers, the Romanians established a front line and resisted the first German attacks in the evening. The next day, during the intense heat, the Romanians launched counterattacks and resisted stubbornly, and despite heavy casualties, withstood the German advance. Neither the Russians nor the Austro-Hungarian forces could really be counted on here. So it was down to the German and Romanian forces to duke it out, which Glenn Torrey describes as a cycle of attack and counterattack. Both sides exhausted themselves, and the battle slowed down. As the Germans had no more reserves to throw in, and the Romanians faced a crisis of command. On August 14th, the Germans began a new attack with a violent artillery barrage, which again met a determined counterattack in a few days. It was pretty much a duel at that point, right? That was determined to be fought to the last bayonet until the Romanians managed a breakthrough on the 19th of August with superior artillery fire and aggressively led reserves. This forced the Germans to retreat and renounced Marasheshti. It was a Romanian victory over the Germans, who in turn had found new respect for an enemy that they thought well beaten. Uh, speaking of the Red Baron, one of our very first special episodes was a bio of him, and you can check that out right here. And you can also uh, follow us on Twitter or Instagram to see all the cool stuff that Flo puts up. Right, Flo? Right, Indy? All right, see you next time.